Here we are for another podcast, Bush. And while we got the chance to say it, I just want to say that I really appreciate you hosting me and looking after me during these podcasts. Of course, my guy. I love it. You know what also needs to be looked after? What? These nuts. Manscaped is the leader in below-the-waist grooming. Now trust them with the whole shebang. Join the 6 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com and using the code TRUEFOOTY20 for 20% off and free shipping. The Manscaped Platinum Package 4.0 is a one-stop shop for a man who deserves it all. They designed this package to allow you to fully align your entire hygiene routine with elite products. What's inside this platinum package, Jesse? You'll find the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, the Weed Whacker ear and nose hair trimmer, ultra premium body wash, ultra premium two-in-one shampoo and conditioner, ultra premium deodorant, there's a real trend here, crop preserver anti-chafing ball deodorant, crop reviver ball spray toner, anti-chafing boxes, and the shed travel bag to hold your goods while traveling. The Lawnmower 4.0 body trimmer and the Weed Whacker nose hair trimmer feature proprietary advanced skin safe technology to protect your delicate parts and holes. Both are waterproof so you can shave with less mess. In addition to shaving, you can now completely upgrade your shower routine with the ultra premium body wash and ultra premium two-in-one shampoo and conditioner. You'll have your skin and hair feeling hydrated and smelling fresh. Don't forget to apply their aluminium free ultra premium deodorant for the, that cologne quality scent on the go. The Platinum Package 4.0 covers all bases from head to toe. The best bang for your shebang with no aluminium. Remember guys, you can get 20% off and free shipping with the code TRUE4020, all caps, all one word, at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping. It's time you enjoyed the finer things in life and get yourself a platinum package for your platinum package. That's platinum, not aluminium. (laughs) Enjoy the podcast. So you're saying you're missing out on some hot D, Jesse. Yeah, I haven't seen the latest episode of House of the Dragon. <laughs> Me neither, buddy. Hot D. <laughs> um, yeah, it's good save there. Whew. <laughs> Just as we started recording. Yep. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the grand final edition of the True Footy Podcast, episode 92. Oh, you'd love a 92 grand final edition, wouldn't you, mate? Oh, excellent segue <laughs> back onto like the one. Eagles. <laughs> uh, it's true. Busher, how are you? Yeah, pretty good. Are you amped for a massive finals? Oh, yeah. Or grand final, rather? Oh, yeah. Should be a good one. Should be a good one. Uh, do, you uh, think, do you think we've got the best two teams left? Probably. Well, best two teams left. Yeah. I meant the best two like, teams. Like, from the year, yeah, I'd say there's been yeah. the best two teams this year. Like, if Melbourne didn't fall off as hard as they did in the back half, they'd be in the conversation, but that six and eight half, back half of the year, mm. puts them out of all credibility for that conversation, I think. Yeah, once Geelong knocked off Brisbane, I felt that the three teams, all of them were a worthy premier, to yeah. be honest. I thought Collingwood was also in that conversation and ultimately weren't quite yeah. good enough, but... You know, that they, they would have made a great grand finalist had they made yeah, it. Considering they were seventeenth last year, it's bloody impressive. Yeah, it's wild. We'll talk about all of that and more as the podcast progresses. Um, starting to get back into a normal sleep cycle, starting yeah. to go to the gym. I've yeah, back off shaved. the Euro clock. Yeah, I am, finally. It was a interesting co- uh, combination of alcohol and sleeping pills that I used <laughs> to try and navigate myself back. Um, but I think I'm back to normal now, which is nice. And I woke up at a reasonable hour today as well, which is great. But uh, I guess we can start off. uh, We'll talk about, you know, the the two prelims, the grand final, obviously, um, with a bit of a focus as well on on the teams that got eliminated, as we always do. Uh, But Brownlow medal happened uh, Sunday night. We're recording this Tuesday. And uh, Paddy Cripps was uh, finally the winner uh, after, you know, many years where he was predicted to go close or... um, you know, I think there was some years maybe he fell away late in the seasons and stuff like that, but uh, finally put it together yeah. for a 29-vote season, yeah, I think it was, it which was. is pretty hefty uh, count. What did you make of the Brownlow? I was, like, everyone knows my thoughts on Carlton, but Patrick Cripps specifically, I've always been a fan of him. Like, a lot of, I've noticed like a lot of Dockers fans, just as a quick aside, aren't fans of him. They think he's a bit dirty and all that shit. I haven't really noticed that yeah, with really. Patrick Cripps. I've always been a fan. I'm probably a bit biased because of mutual friends. I don't know him personally, but there's mutual friends mm. there. But he's always seemed like a good dude, goes about it. He's just sort of been stuck on a, not the best team until this year and the team sort of finally delivered to the standard to get him enough wins, to get enough three-vote games. Even though he still did poll outstandingly in games where mm. they lost, like he always has. But he had, finally had enough wins on the board to get it done. Yeah, I remember he polled 20 votes in a two-win season. Um, sure. And I noticed the Eagles, as a team, polled 15 votes in a two-win yeah. season. The fewest ever. Yeah, um, they had the graphic was like Petraka and yeah. Oliver versus the Eagles. Yeah, yeah. I, the Eagles as a team wouldn't have placed even close to the top yeah. 10. But. I saw an interesting one as another quick little side. It was like the last three years worth of votes. It was like Petraka and Oliver were one and two. 
Is that right? Yeah, Oliver was one with 70, and then Petraka was like equal second with and 67 with Lockie Neal. And neither of them have a medal. Which exactly, which yeah. is... Lockie Neal got very close to winning it. Oh, yeah. That was actually probably the, the one of the best counts I've ever seen uh, in terms of in the final round, we had, you know, four potential winners. Uh, and, and, you know, between Took and Lockie, like, I thought that they were about to win like it was sure. it wasn't clear that Cripps was about to win it other than the fact that the they, second they did Brisbane game first though yes. and I went yep Cripps is winning it because yeah. I thought Carlton Collingwood the last knew he had 35 that game yeah that, that gave kind it of away knew Gildog was setting it up for that 100% but uh, there's no other way to do it so yeah. that's why they gave it away yeah, I guess yeah. but yeah, I they was, give it away to people who notice that sort of shit like the average punter watching would have just been like Ugh. yeah yeah that's yeah. true but I'm happy for Cripps I think he seems like a bit of a gentleman to be honest I've always yeah. really liked him um, yeah, I was a fan of his speech. He was very genuine, sort of spoke about some of his struggles and stuff, like mm. speaking publicly and stuff. Yeah, it was quite a vulnerable speech, wasn't yeah. it? It was almost just like, man, Carlton sucked. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's kind of... Yeah, half of it was just go. like, I'm glad my team doesn't suck anymore. Yeah, it's, been, it's like, fuck, it's been hard being a Carlton player. That, that was kind of the theme of it. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it was funny to, to watch him up there. And I remember a few weeks before the 2013 draft, uh, I was sitting in the Curtin Abacus Lab um, yeah studying oh, but many also looking, memories. looking at the draft stuff yeah. which is what I did around exam times in November yeah. and I do remember Patrick Cripps coming in and sitting like probably about as far away as that couch and sitting down yeah. on a computer and he was on the AFL website too and I, I obviously knew who he was yeah. this before he was drafted and he was just a tall and kind of chubby guy and it's just funny to think now that I was like in the presence of a yeah. Brownlow medalist it's quite <laughs> it's quite surreal to think about but uh, yeah happy for him he seems like a good dude yeah, and I can't help but notice the um, the fact that Carlton just love these individual awards. They've, yeah. they've been racking them up lately. The last two Coleman medalists, yeah. now a Brownlow medalist, and the rising star in twenty nineteen yeah. in Sam Walsh. So it just really sums up like where their top end talents at. Like mm. they've still got to fill out those like sixteen to twenty two guys on the field, mm -hmm. but their top end talent is as good as anyone's, if not better. That's true. And they've obviously identified that they've been going after some. Um, I wouldn't call them role players like Adam Chera and Hewitt, um, yeah. Blake Hager's potentially. Hager's is the definition of one of those 16 to 22 yeah. role players, but it's a very high end 16 to 22 role player. Yeah, exactly. At least when he's in a contract year. Mm. Yep, I agree with that assessment of their list. And But uh, yeah, overall, happy to see Paddy Troops win it. It was, uh, it was good. Yeah. And good to see a new winner. I would have been happy with Miller as well, but yeah. Yeah, I would have been happy with Miller. I would have won 160 bucks. <laughs> yeah. I would have been happy with Brayshaw with my 450 bucks, but true. That's the nature of betting. Yeah, he'll uh, he'll go close again. Uh, yeah, some time, some point in his career. If yeah, it's not Brayshaw's Brayshaw. last crack. No, same with Miller. Both definitely pretty young not. players. So, um, we'll talk a little bit about the prelim busher. Yep. So we'll start with the cats and lions one. Uh, yeah. Chronologically, that was first. Obviously, this game there, I felt like there was some early resistance with the lions. I mean, obviously, there were a couple of goals down at quarter time, but it felt like, yeah, they were sort of yeah. in it. Uh, but unfortunately, they just couldn't stay competitive for the four quarters. How surprised were you that they lost by 71 points? Surprised that it was that much of a shit show. Like, they've had that tendency to sort of be close and have that happen, but mm. I thought that sort of probably would have progressed to a point where they would have bowed out with a bit more dignity, as harsh as that sort of sounds. Yeah. But I suppose yeah. so. I, I mean, there's... It's hard to evaluate a season where a team misses out on the four, but then they win a final unexpectedly and go deep in finals. Yeah. And you'd say a prelim's deep. And they've progressed further than they did last year. With that in yeah. mind, how do you think they will reflect on this season? To that point, I'd sort of argue they'd probably be the team that's most disappointed they missed the four out of all the teams that missed the four. They were the mm. team that's been there the last few years. They're still young enough and had enough internal growth to be a top four team. It just didn't happen this year, Yeah, which I think was probably their biggest failure of the year really that's true but regardless they would have had to have played yeah. uh geelong yeah, at yeah. the very least at um at the mcg in yeah. the final so I, I think they can sort of rest in knowing that this wasn't going to be their year either yeah. way uh but yeah i think i think there's there's some positive out of the fact that they won a big final in melbourne like that was one of the biggest yeah. question marks on them going into this year, mm. season as a contender um, it didn't I wouldn't have expected it that they'd miss the four, which they've been mm. consistently doing. They're hitting the four uh, and then losing the finals. This this time mm. they actually had a good final series with two good wins over a good Richmond side. Yep. And uh, and Melbourne obviously went out in straight sets, but still beating them at the MCG. You got yeah. to give credit to Brisbane. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be a sort of mixed reaction to the season. I think uh, almost like a bittersweet yeah. sort of analysis where 
Uh, there's positives there, but ultimately they've fallen short again. Yeah, um, I've just realised probably between the last two podcasts, I've probably pissed off the Brisbane fans quite immensely. How so? Well, a few of them seem to take exception to my analysis of the Berry situation, which admittedly oh, yeah. I've seen. I have because I'd sort of amalgamated the whole thing together and saw the stuff at the end <laughs> where Berry had gotten back on top. I but now seeing the footage of it again, I got to admit they were right. Those, these people in the comments, I'll, yeah. Shout yeah, them out. I, I was in the pod and I was confused. I was like, I, I didn't see Barry get back on top of him, but it's okay. Yeah. You made a mistake. That's yeah. all right. We're human. You wouldn't have yeah. done it deceptively. It's just, no. a, just yeah. a mistake. Because I sort of saw like the aftermath where Barry was sort of getting back into him and stuff. Right. And sort of combined the whole yeah. sort of thing in my head. Yeah, fair enough. Worth addressing. Yeah. That's yeah. good. Um, yeah, so overall, um, the, the Lions can take something out of this season. Do you think they'll be back next year and considering they're going to potentially end up with Dunkley and Ashcroft and... Um, there's another player linked to them recently. I heard it on the news today, and I, it's escaping me right at the yeah. critical point. But um, either way, even just those two, even just those two is a tremendous yeah. off season. So, do you think they'll? Be I back definitely again? don't think they're going anywhere. They're still their list profile's still young enough. They've still got enough consistency and depth across their positions where they can sort of handle a few injuries that come about playing football. Yeah, they've still got the top end talent. They've still got the support. Locking. They're still thereabouts to be a contender. They just sort of need to go from contender to champion. Yeah, exactly. And that will the, the last that's box the they biggest need to leap is beating these yeah. best teams away. Yeah. Um, but and Geelong is a juggernaut this year. Yeah. let's face it. So. But that's the biggest leap any team has to make yeah. from contender to champion because there's yeah. only one champion. There can be five, six contenders. Mm. And Neil, yeah. in particular, obviously nearly won the Brownlow Medal. Yep. Uh, he's twenty nine years old. Yep. I feel like he can play for another five, like the way he's going. His, his style, like, his yeah. St- exactly. His style su- to, uh, speaks to a player that can probably play to, like, 33, 34, I reckon, yeah. to a good standard. Yeah. The other prelim bush was one we live-streamed. This one mm. started with the Swans getting a four-goal jump over the, the Pies. And yep. uh, I don't know about you, but unlike the first prelim, I felt throughout this game, even though the Swans were, you know, putting the scoreboard pressure on, that the game was on. Yeah, certainly. It, w- contrast that to the other game, and maybe that was a little bit of... Um, with a bit of knowledge that Brisbane yeah. are not great at the G yeah. against Geelong in particular. Well, with the Brisbane game, until it was sort of about early in the third, I sort of gave up on them. Mm. But like, it was one of those things that wasn't insurmountable for them. Like, yeah. you just sort of knew if Brisbane played at their best and caught them off guard, they could have done it. But yeah. whereas Collingwood, Swans, like, there was a lot more margin for error for Collingwood to stay in that game. True. I felt like they were, they were playing. And, and looking more threatening yeah. than the Lions. At least that was yeah. my, my perception of it. Um, and, and that instinct was right because they yeah. came back hard. Oh, yeah. Uh, even though the Pies were still in it and playing some good passages of the footy, the Swans seemed to have all the answers. It felt like every time Collingwood yep. would get a good goal, the Swans would stream out of the centre and either <laughs> score or get close. And, um, or lock it in their 50 for a bit. Yeah, and they yeah. couldn't let the Pies get the run on. Um, when McInerney gold uh, with that intercept where he sort of ran past, <laughs> I think it was Jeremy Howe, took the mark and ran into an open goal, it was 86-51. to 51. Uh, and then, obviously, the insane comeback, which sure. Sean would score off the top of my head, probably like seven, six, six of the last seven or yeah, seven of the last something eight. Something would have yeah. been close to that. Um, and that would have almost been a comeback on the level of Nick Davis 2005. Like It felt like that kind of moment. They just couldn't, sure. quite, couldn't quite get their hands on the footy in that last 15 seconds. Uh, um, great prelim. Oh, yeah. Of the best Cracker I game, yeah. yeah. Bloody oath. I, I, can you think of a better prelim? It's hard off the top. It's very of the hard stuff. to. Even though there were patches of the game where we were a little bored and sort of going off on Star True. Wars related tangents and stuff, but <laughs> I don't recall. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like ultimately, it was a very good game. Mm. Some of that middle sequence where it was sort of just Sydney maintaining that sort of mid steady lead, yeah, got a little dry at times. But on the whole, it was quite an engaging, entertaining game. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, if Collingwood just had this knack this year of running over the top of teams, I think their running uh, power this year. Um, was huge and that hence their ability to win close games throughout the year what do they win they were six and oh in games less than a goal during the regular season they were oh and two in finals in games that was decided by less than a goal yeah which is uh unfortunate but they happened to play yeah geelong and sydney um and oh, yeah. then obviously uh too good for Fremantle in the middle of there but yep. they've jumped from 17th to second um if we're doing a letter grade, I think it's fair to say A+. plus. Uh, as far as... That's as I don't know. As they somehow transcended the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's true. what I'll say in relation to their season. They transcend the alphabet. Yeah. When you only get one point from a grand final after finishing seven... Excuse me. 17th. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the list profile there, it's not as though they completely rebuilt their list. Yeah. They just kind of got their shit together uh, mm. whilst adding some really good young talent. Obviously, Nick Dacos, everyone yep. talks about every week. Um uh, 
But Never heard of him. <laughs> yeah. Craig McRae here, though, as a first-year coach, that is a sensational effort. Do you think, Ooh, yeah. Do you think he gets coach of the year? I'd probably have to give it to him. Yeah. There's, there's no real, like, criteria for coach yeah. of the year. It's usually going to a team that improves the most. Yeah, it'd be Collingwood. Because we're, like, Collingwood, oh, sorry, Geelong, they have all the talent. And mm-hmm. they're all, thereabouts every year. So it's just, which Scott brother is it again? Chris. Chris, yep, Chris <laughs> Scott. Just doing his job consistently. He's been there 11 yeah. years, yeah. man. <laughs> but I always get the Scott boys mixed up. Yeah. But yeah, then, yeah, mm. he's just done his job every year. Who else is there about? Brizzy's Longmire, been there about. I think. Longmuir. Or, Longmire. Oh, yeah, Horse Longmire. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I mean, Longmuir as well, but Longmire, yeah. I think, as yeah. well. This, this team was in the bottom yeah, four yeah. two years ago. So. Yeah, yeah, Meyer. But I think in terms of just this season, if you're isolating it, McRae. Yeah, McRae one, Longmire two, Longmuir three. Yeah. It's probably how I'd do that. Yeah, I don't mind that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So we'll talk a little bit about the grand final. But first, there was some news. I think it was today or yesterday. Buddy Franklin has signed a one-year extension with the Sydney Footy Club. Yep. Nine years ago, uh, he would have signed that monstrous deal back in 2013. I remember where I was when I heard about it sure. because we thought he was going to GWS. Uh, and I was like, no, he's uh, agreed to a nine-year deal with the Swans. We were sceptical, or at least some people were at the time, that he was going to see out that nine years. It was just it appeared to be a way of smoothing out his contract. Yeah, yeah. Um, but here he is, nine years later, signing on for another 10th year <laughs> at the Sydney Footy Club. How do you reflect on his career move now, potentially playing in a grand final win this I, week? I don't know if I was saying it to you or if I was saying it to my dad the other day, but I think... We are similar. Yeah, but I think he's the player of the era, Buddy yeah. Franklin. I'd have to put yeah. him above Ablett Jr., some of these other guys. He's the player of the era. Mm. Era is a very ambiguous sort of thing. Yeah, true, like, yeah. What does it mean? <laughs> like, probably... Well, since we've been watching footy, that's probably how yeah. we, like, loosely identify yeah. it. Yeah. So I'd sort of say, like, the mid-2000s to now mm. is Buddy's era. Like, he's probably the last truly elite key forward that's going to kick a 1,000 goals. That yeah, we're well, probably the last one to do it. Yeah. Maybe. There's, there hasn't been many to do it. So he's ticked off that box this year. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, then probably the next layer down, in my, at least yeah. in my opinion, would be, be a Judd's Ablets um, and yeah. Dusty Fife. Yeah. And the thing is, he's made six grand finals now as well, buddy. That's the other thing that puts him mm. as the player of the era, I think. Yeah. And he's won a reasonable percentage of them as well. Yeah. So if he wins this weekend, it'll be three from six. Yeah. Yeah. But um, even two from six isn't the worst no, percentage. No. Yeah. no, they're playing that many grand finals. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it shows how much of an impact he has. Um, in my opinion but I guess if you're looking at it from a Sydney perspective um, uh, does it hinge on this weekend or do you think they've got the return on their investment already they've got the return on their investment because there's a team that's trying to make New South Welshmen give a shit about football (laughs) they've done everything in their power to possibly engage a crowd Mm. and get a team people invested in their team yep They've done everything they could plausibly do in a rugby-dominated state to make that happen. You're right. So they've lost two grand finals with Buddy in the in the side, uh, mm-hmm. one against his old side, and and then I think he was playing in twelve against Sydney as well, ironically. Mm-hmm. But um, so yeah, yet to win a premiership with this pl- this player on their list uh, that could change this weekend. But it'll be also interesting to anal- uh, sorry in the analysis to work out like what was the opportunity cost of getting Buddy Franklin on their list? Like what? Well, who, which players did they lose? I'm, I'm not actually asking I, you. To I answer can't that. recall any no. significant. I think they got him because of the cost of living at the time quite yeah. efficiently. They got him for the yeah. door because of the cost of the living allowance at the time. Mm. I dare say though, some players they could have recruited and didn't, and then also players maybe got squeezed out. We, we I, was, I was sort of suggesting like a Tom Mitchell sort of came to mind, mm. maybe, but yeah, they that, were sort of going to get pushed out anyway, I think. Yeah, I think that was more midfield opportunity. Yeah. So I, I don't know the answer to that, and I think it's stuff mm. we're not privy to, but I'm just, I think it's worth noting that there would have been some cost to having Buddy Franklin on the list. Mm. Uh, but There would have been guys that took pay cuts, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's probably true. Hey. Prob- I was, Adam Goods probably would have taken a pay cut at that stage of his career, I think, mm. when Buddy first came across. Yeah. Those sort of people. Yeah, that's true. Adam Good seems like the sort of guy to take a pay cut for the team. Yeah. But it is incredible how Sydney have kind of rebuilt in two years. <laughs> you know what I mean? But And the thing is, they had a lot of the pieces two years ago in the shit. They had Haney, but he was sort of a bit up and down, true. but he was always a very highly regarded prospect. Yeah. Callum Mills, Mills was there. Florent was there, but he wasn't the level he's at now, like a Florent sort yeah. of guy. They've benefited yeah. well from... The academy picks, like, yep. let's be honest. So he wouldn't, should never have gone to them in theory in an open pool. Yep. Um, and likewise, Mills. Even Errol Golden. 
Yeah, that's true. Braden, uh, Braden Campbell, Campbell. nothing is featured as much. No, that's true. Uh, so they have benefited from that, but we have to also acknowledge that they are very good at drafting. Guys um, like Chad Warner. Oh, Chad, Chad Warner, Warner yeah. they've pulled out of the second. McInerney. Yep. Um, players that weren't high draft picks. Will like, Haywood. Yep, yep. He was like, uh, I think, pick 21 or something like yeah. that. And, and they've just historically had an amazing mm. culture, yeah. I think. I think that's evident. Players play longer. Yeah. A few of the stalwarts are still around, like your Sam Rage, your Josh Kennedys, your Lukey Parkers. Yeah, although J- Josh Kennedy has sadly just retired. Yeah. Um, he's still around the boys, though, but yeah, yeah, yeah he's yeah. retired. I was just sort of making yeah. a segue there, but you're right, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was a little tangent about Sydney, but um, we'll talk a little bit about the grand final and, and how these teams sort of went this year. I think it's obvious one was first and the other one was yeah. third, but uh, I saw an interesting uh, quote. I don't know when this quote was made, but Chris Scott has said this only because I saw it on, on the couch. He said, if we finish ninth because we've primed ourselves to perform better, better late in the year, we will live with that. So um, basically what that means is Geelong have deliberately optimized their sort of fitness and uh, programs and strength and conditioning to be better late yep. in seasons. And that is pretty evident based on how their season went. So they were And their f- age profile, it sort true. of explains. So they're f- they were five and four after f- nine rounds. And I, for one, and I'm sure many other people, and if people say it i'm sure most of them are lying but after at five and four there was serious doubt geelong Mm. were a contender this year and they haven't lost since so they lost to frio at home Mm. and and then there was a hawthorne loss in there somewhere and you know the the questions were rightfully being asked no disrespect to frio but obviously that was an unexpected loss for geelong Mm. but they're undefeated since then yeah so that obviously shows that they've primed themselves for later in the season they've got one more to go but very professionally done and equally the swans have their last loss was on the 2nd of July, where Essendon ran over the top of them at the MCG. Yeah. That is a seriously strong run. Ooh, yeah. So we've got two teams here that in the back half of the season have performed incredibly yeah. well, and they're colliding at the yeah. uh, at the final well, the final game yeah. of the season. So I guess I kind of think of it, this is almost like a, the old veteran side in Geelong meeting the young up-and-coming side that's slipped under the radar a little bit. And maybe Sydney's list profile... There is a lot of veterans still. Like uh, I'm sure it isn't the youngest on yeah. the mean average. It's close though, I believe. Is it really? Yeah, wow. it's very close. It's like Freo, I think, is the youngest list, and then there's like your North Melbourne types, mm. and then Sydney's sort of right thereabouts as well. Yeah, okay. I didn't. In realize terms of that. 22 under 22, they had the most people picked for the squad of 40. Yeah, so th- that's what I was kind yeah. of alluding to was just the fact that their their young kids are all guns, yeah. or, or like they've got so many in that team. I think six mm. players under right. 22. Two or 21 were mm. playing in the grand final and I think mm. West Coast I saw the, the comparison was that we have eight on the list or something <laughs> ridiculous like that uh. um, but yeah so yeah a team that has been able to draft really well putting aside their academy picks and just routinely be contenders yeah. and that's the thing both of these sides are perennial contenders yeah. right? since we've been watching footy Geelong and Sydney have been around the mark dip down for a couple of years at, yeah. at the worst I was going to say how many years combined do you reckon they've missed finals in your time of watching footy I think Sydney lost single digits S- Sydney missed in 09 I remember mm. that and, uh, well I remember reading about it I don't remember it happening uh, <laughs> and then I missed in I think it was 18 and 19 or yeah. 19 and 20 might have been 19 mm. and 20 yeah. and um, so they missed for a couple of years I reckon yeah, Maybe probably there less than five, year. I'd say, for both clubs. Yeah, yeah. And Geelong missed the finals since 07, because I've been watching footy since 02. Yeah. Since 07, Geelong have missed the finals, I reckon, at a guess once. Chair. Yeah. Let us know in the comments, but uh, I reckon I reckon that once. Yeah, and I'd I, say less than a handful between I think between it was 2015 as well. Mm. So, yeah, we're talking probably five at a max. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I, I think for me, the, the Swans' ability to regenerate and hit grand finals every four to six years is incredible. And plug and play a bit as well. Yeah, so Geelong kind of um, are consistently around the mark and then occasionally bob in, whereas Sydney do fluctuate a little bit more, I feel, uh, mostly because, you know, they dip down the ladder over the last two to three years. Uh, A couple of bottom four finishes in there as well. mm. But their ability to bounce back into finals is, in, or grand finals specifically, yeah. is incredible. So the grand finals they've played in were 05, 06, then a six year gap to 12, and then 14, and then 16, yep. and then a six year gap to 22. That's yeah. that's quite unusual in terms of a grand final life cycle or, or yeah. a, a premiership list life cycle. Mm. So their ability to do that is incredible, yeah. as is Geelong's ability to yeah. stay relevant with their aging list. Mm. 
I'll say something, but I'm sure will cheer you up. That Sydney sort of like timeline that you were just talking about, it's sort of similar to how the Eagles have been historically as a club since coming in. I'd sort of say they've been, yeah, maybe not grand finals as much, but sort of that consistent sort of finals and able to rebuild reasonably quickly. That's true, which gives me hope. Yeah, yeah but I've just been nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's the first positive thing we've said about the Eagles in 12 months. <laughs> probably, probably longer, to be honest, but. Um, you're right, and I think uh, it's interesting now to uh, to use that as a tangent. As a West Coast fan, I, th- I think West Coast kind of look at the Geelong model now and and look at why can't we do that? So keep mm. on your veterans and and believe that you can play well late into mm. your career and, and then sprinkle in some youth here and there. Yeah. But Geelong are obviously doing it to perfection, and yeah. and you see the opposite example of, of West Coast. And the thing is, with that sort of approach, there's a lot more margin for error. I think, especially with older guys who are more injury prone, more mm. prone to just have that natural decline as they get older yeah you're riding on a lot more variables yeah geelong too seem to have this ability to attract players to, yeah. to them as well definitely which... they've one year they're luring in patrick dangerfield a couple yeah. years later gary ablett jr a couple yeah. years later jeremy cameron jeremy cameron yeah. those are ugly three of the top 10 players of the last 10 years <laughs> <laughs> it's true it, that is um it, it's it's you could say that that's an advantage, but at the same time, like it's not the city of or town of Geelong, whatever it is, that is the advantage they got. They've got it from being such a fantastic club, and there is some location. I think there effort. is because a lot of those guys are country Victorian and yeah, like okay. the sort of lifestyle of having a bit more of a property and being able yeah. to go to have a surf in the morning. Okay, I'll which I don't think is as much of a thing in Melbourne compared to Geelong. No, you're right. I I, I agree with that, but I also think it's also a byproduct of them being a fantastic yeah. football Definitely, organization. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so we've talked about the list and banged on about that both of these sides are either first or second both offensively and defensively I've read so we're looking at uh, it's hard to see which team is going to get over Uh the top how how do you see this game playing out it's going to be interesting the one thing that makes me really think it's going to be interesting is Sydney's ability to stop teams sort of steamrolling and Mm. building too much momentum to overcome Mm -hmm. it was sort of a theme in the Melbourne game where they sort of Every time Melbourne started looking like the Melbourne of old, they were able to quell it. Yeah. And they really sort of are well geared up to sort of play that fast transition-y, handball-y type game, but it also at the same time play that kick-to-kick, more methodical yeah. approach, which sort of seem to be the two strategies teams sort of try and go with these days with yeah. their own little tweaks and whatever. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I think my, I've looked at the forecast and this can change for anyone, let alone Melbourne. But the right. forecast at the moment is, is for a pretty cold grand final, yep. 14 degrees and a 60% chance of rain. So that will probably, in my vague awareness of the, how these guys play, but I think that Geelong are probably the stronger wet weather side. So if this hmm. turns into a Dow contest, I don't think Sydney will struggle, but it yep. does take away a little bit of their hmm. um, their advantage, their fast ball movement, um, whereas Geelong are kind of geared to play that slow methodical style yeah. as well and bombing it and they've got the targets to just bomb yeah. in your forward line and hope 100% because even though the Swans have Buddy Franklin he's not really an aerial assaultist that's right he's more of a like lead up guy mm. yeah exactly more exactly. of a wheel and fire from 50 type <laughs> yeah, of thing yeah 100% and uh, very very effectively yeah. as well and even Logan McDonald's probably a little young to be really that pack crashing threat Sam Reid does it a bit but he even he's got question marks over whether he'll be playing this week that's right so we'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, injury news the uh, for Max Holmes, he was the main yep. one in doubt for the Cats. Uh, apparently, scans weren't as bad as first feared. Uh, yep. He did a fitness test today. I think he's still in a bit of pain. Wasn't yep. running that well. Uh, but if there's no structural damage, then hopefully... Mm. Then They'll give him can, a shot and let him go. Yeah, I think the, the advent of the medical sub makes it a little bit easier yeah. to take these risks, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so... He may, may be a chance. Uh, as for the Swans injury news, Sam Reed will test for an adductor strain. Um, he was subbed out in the prelim, so that's a, that's a maybe. And then if it's a wet grand final, maybe they don't take that risk yeah. anyway. It's hard to say with all these like grand final injury reports. You don't know whether it's gamesmanship or True. what to an True. extent. Like They might just be trying to make the other team think about a possible possibility mm. that they can waste energy on rather than focus on what's actually going to be presented to them on the day. Especially if one of them's at all, because yeah. that changes the structural dynamic of the game. Uh, another one was McInerney, who missed training for the Swans on Tuesday, oh. which is today. I just read the article. and uh, But apparently he's not considered in doubt. Yeah. So that is the team news. I do like to go through head-to-head, yep. giggity, um, with, when doing tips for a game. Yeah. Another giggity. 
these two sides have only met at the MCG twice, which mm. I found interesting considering, um, you know, both, both sure. clubs have been for, around for a while. Uh, mind you, the, the, uh, the stats I read probably didn't include South Melbourne, but yeah. Sydney, as, as it were, uh, have only played Geelong at the MCG twice and both were recent finals. So yeah. you had the 2017 prelim and the yeah. Cats, uh, sm- sorry, 2017 semi and the yeah. Cats won heavily. And in 2016, Sydney smashed them in the prelim yeah. to make the grand final against the Bulldogs. Probably both games are too far away to really get a form read on, I'd yeah. say, considering how much, in particular, Sydney yeah. have changed since then in terms of style as well. Last time they met was back in round four. So, again, not a great form reading, but it was and it was at the SCG. Buddy Franklin kicks his 1,000th goal, and Sydney win by five goals. So, mm. it's not a lot to go off. It's not as though these sides met in week one of the finals and Geelong spanked mm. them or vice versa. So, I, d- I don't think, considering as well Geelong are not a, a true MCG side. Uh, and Sydney's ability to win at the MCG is pretty good, barring their loss to Essendon at the, uh, in the middle of the year. I think they have shown an ability to win games at the MCG. So this isn't a true neutral game, but I don't think it's going to play a factor that Geelong's mm. the Victorian side. Do you agree with that? Not as much as it usually would, I yeah. don't think. Yeah. Like not if it was a Brisbane or something, you'd or sort Collingwood of... Collingwood West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's not like not like even if it was Geelong Brisbane, you'd sort of probably give Geelong that more of yeah. advantage. Whereas Sydney sort of doesn't have that voodoo hanging over their head as much. They're arguably as good away from home as they are at home. Mm. Um, yeah, so yeah. I, I, yeah, so long story short, the form lines mean nothing. <laughs> uh, let's finish up the podcast with our predictions. I want to know your winner and the margin. Ooh, I'll probably have to go with Geelong they've sort of been thereabouts the last few years this is probably the year where they break through they've sort of set themselves up too well for it the acquisitions of Jez Cameron sort of taken a couple of years to really get to this point but now that they've got that fully humming I'm thinking Geelong 22 points 22 points who are you going for is the important <sighs> probably question. Sydney I'm barracking for yeah any particular reason sort of they just feel like Fremantle's list profile, but like a year or so ahead of where we're at, and sort of so to validate your own Fremantle aside. Yeah, well, it sort of feels like a bit of a like show me the path sort of thing. <laughs> like to say a team that sort of built themselves like with a list the way they've built their list. Yeah, can get the job done even as an interstate team. Mm. I think if Geelong don't win, they'd probably be one of the best sides to not win in a given year. Oh yeah, to so go eighteen and four and and genuinely be yeah. you know as good as they are with Cameron and Hawkins. Are the first two players I think of when I think of Geelong. Yeah, it's uh, it, it'd be kind of a shame without it. When that being said, I will support Sydney on the day. I, yeah. I like Sydney. Yeah. Um, well, that's interesting as an Eagles fan. Like in Sydney, there's a bit yeah, of back nah, and forth. Well, maybe for some. I, for us, I think we always felt a bit of a respect for Sydney during yeah. those years. I don't. I don't think for the most part there was yeah. much. It was a rivalry, it. like a friendly one, not a. Yeah, equally with with Collingwood in. Yeah. Um, Again, irrelevant to this conversation, but I yeah. felt the same way about Collingwood. We had that really yeah. good rivalry for a few years there, and I, yeah. I don't mind them either. Yeah. And I don't mind Geelong either. I'm just yeah. saying I'm probably going to barrack Sydney. I always pick a grand final team. Yeah. That being said, I think Geelong win this game by nine points. Mm. Norm Smith? Well, Normie. Jazz Cameron I'm going with. I like it. I like it. I went with Tom Stewart if yep. it's a more of a dower low scoring game. Yep. Uh, hopefully he has a big game. First goal, the real important stuff. Mm, I'm going to go with my favourite name in the AFL, Grian Myers. Grian Myers. Oh, 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 Grian. <laughs> Son of Greg and Brian. Um, Grino, <laughs> Grino Myers. Um, first goal, I went with Tyson Stengel. Nice. I was, he, was, I was, he was my other option in my head, I must yeah. say. Well, Gary Rowan's not a bad shout, just as a yeah. slip him into. Yeah, gross. <laughs> um, if the Swans win, I reckon I'm going to... Chuck a bit of money on a like a separate bet for a Sydney win. I'll say Chad yeah. Warner bobs up for a Norm Smith. Yeah, if okay. Sydney win, he's a very good shout. Mm. I'll give you that. Yeah, shirt. I like it. But genuinely, this is going to be a, a really good grand final. It's hard to imagine. We say this every year, but it's hard to imagine one team not showing up between yeah. these two sides. I think they're both too good not yeah. to let this be close. And have the ability not to let team steamroll them as well. 100%. Yeah, I can't imagine Sydney getting rolled. And, yeah. I, and I can't imagine Geelong getting rolled. Yeah. Um, that's my analysis. So in a weird way, I can imagine Geelong getting rolled more than I can imagine Sydney getting rolled. Even though I imagine Geelong winning it in a lot more scenarios than yeah. I imagine Sydney winning it in. Interesting. As weird as that sounds. It does sound weird, but I, I get it. Yeah. So yeah, we'll um, we'll wrap up the grand final podcast there, guys. That's our predictions. We both think Geelong 
by one to three goals, <laughs> roughly. So hopefully it's a good grand final. Um, hope you enjoy it as well. And we'll be back as well. Um, we'll do a post-podcast, a post-grand final podcast as well. Yeah. We'll do a post-podcast grand final. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thanks guys for tuning in. Um, this will be up on YouTube as well as Spotify if you're watching on the opposite platform. So, Wasn't thanks. a Drewsy whinging on the last one going, why haven't you uploaded the Spotify? <laughs> yeah, I blatantly forgot to do it for like three days. Yep. Um, but... I'm sorry, guys. I'm back. (laughs) Yeah, we got you, Drews. Thanks, guys. We'll see you in the next one. Enjoy the grand final.